everyone is born with some sort of disability or handicap. For many, these are genetic. Poor eyesight, a predisposition towards some disease or psychological abnormality. A malformation of the body. We all have an idea or prediction of what a normal life might be like. And in every case, this concept of normalcy is virtually indistinguishable from perfection. Someone who can walk, talk, see, and breathe normally might have dyslexia or suffer from aphantasia or anhedonia or be entirely devoid of a sexual attraction. Individually, our standards of normality can usually be recognized as a life in which something we lack is present or something that plagues us is absent. This is a fair assessment, but if we were to gain that thing we lack, or lose the thing with which we struggle, our idea of normal would expand accordingly, and we would eventually be aspiring towards a physical, intellectual, and emotional perfection, an impossibility for humanity. It's not my place to establish a universal definition of perfection. My personal belief is that human beings cannot achieve perfection because it's a functionally abstract concept and anything approaching it would require the fundamental reworking or even the complete erasure of what makes us human. I do know and will speak about my own disability. My own handicap that has complicated my life and forced me to adapt to personal circumstances that most people have never dealt with and perhaps will never deal with. My disability can be easily stated, but explaining it is a laborious and reflectively painful process. To put it simply, I can see a person's spiritual history. I've chosen this term as a semantic compromise. I will expand upon this shortly. Ordinarily, when someone says that they can do something, you would consider whatever it is to be an ability, a skill, oftentimes even an advantage, not something that detracts from their quality of life and causes them to suffer. Because of this perspective, a more appropriate description would be that I am susceptible to the reception of their spiritual history. To simply say that I can see them might suggest that I control the function, that I can choose when to access or tap into the site. This is not the case. They are merely shown to me, intimated without my consent. I bear the burden just as you bear the burden of the sun in your eyes as you walk to some destination. Were this the only issue, I might have been able to live a happy life. I might have adjusted to it, even received medication to mitigate it, if it could be accurately diagnosed. But other issues arose initially during my teenage years and were intensified and as I grew older until now, almost 26 years old. My life is episodically terrifying and I often consider ending it just to escape the horrors which relentlessly harrow and haunt me. A more intimate description of my susceptibility as it's been established and the manifestation of the terror that has resulted from it will be provided in the recounting of a single event that happened two years ago. It is not the worst of the many terrifying incidents, but it is one that I reflect upon the most, because it was the event during which I realized that there is no humanly achievable relief from my affliction, and that each day, each moment of life, conscious or unconscious, is a futile, theatrical gesture of survival. Two years ago, while walking my dog, I happened to pass by a group of people. Like everyone else, they exuded a certain element. Not necessarily an aura or any kind of gaseous or a spectral emission, but an ultra-physical emanation. This, unfortunately, is the best way I can describe my perception of their spiritual history. I call it spiritual because saying psychic isn't contextually accurate. I'm not seeing or receiving their thoughts or even impressions of their emotions. I call it history, and not potentialities or permutations, because the events, the chronologies I perceive are more akin to eventualities, faded inevitabilities. They either have occurred, will occur, 
or, and stay with me here, if they haven't occurred and cannot be seen to, they transpire not as a chartable, recordable moment, but resonances of possibility. As I walked by this group, I nodded politely and steered my dog in a wide arc around them. They smiled and greeted him as anyone would friendly a dog, and we passed by each other. They had been approaching along the same sidewalk, in what would have been a perfectly normal interaction for anyone else. But for me, just as I had passed by, I noticed something which had chilled my blood, and caused the immediate ejection of the peace of mind to which I had meekly managed to hold on in those days. From a distance, I had seen three distinct spiritual histories, three ultra-physical emanations unique to each person. But as I passed within hand's reach of that group, I realized that there were only two spiritual histories present. The person farthest away, the leftmost in relation to my position, had drawn the spiritual history of the middle person over himself, and somehow distorted it so that it appeared differently. I had never witnessed the sharing of spiritual histories before, even among families. My parents who remain totally ignorant of my susceptibility have very different histories, for example. The histories are impossible to mix up, and are more distinct, more unique than DNA, if you can believe it. Likewise, I had never seen someone who lacked a spiritual history. When I realized what I had seen, I stopped in place, ignoring the tugging of my dog who had tired of the walk by then and wanted to return home. It was not the mere shock of having seen this unusual phenomenon, but also the implications introduced by it. My mind immediately birthed and considered the question, what does it mean? And like many existential questions which are not immediately answerable, fear sparked to life within my heart. When I looked back at the group, which had continued walking past me, my unrest was not assuaged by what I saw. In fact, my fear blossomed into actual dread, and my already dark outlook on life had blackened. I saw the person who had lacked a spiritual history turn to me, and in a brief yet unforgettable moment, watched as they suddenly exuded a powerful spiritual history. Like a black flame that spontaneously and violently issued from some noxious incense utilized by a deplorable sorcerer and his wicked practices. And I knew, after having seen countless histories, that this person's history was not human. And that beside those two ordinary people was something wholly alien to our species and planet. Compared to this black, more so an elemental nature than visible color, history... The histories of the two ordinary humans seemed vestigial, diminutive, almost lifeless. If spiritual histories could be seen as reflections of life, and to me, this was appalling because I had never given much thought to the measurement of life in degrees of substantiality. Human histories, though unique, were more or less equal in perceptible intensity. I saw as much of one history as another, but this new history... This emanation that raged like a monstrous fire in comparison to these smoldering embers beside it had set a new standard for life, forced me to reconsider what that word meant. I can't imagine anything more terrifying, more psychologically and existentially poisonous to the human mind as it exists today than for a person to doubt the validity of his own existence. People question their sanity all the time. I did for the first few years. People question the reality. These simulation theory is pretty commonly known, and more accepted than most other conspiracies and fantastical theories regarding our world and its place in the universe. But in both examples, the idea emerges from the base consideration, a coping mechanism perhaps, that there is a stability of mind or realness of being that can be obtained or exists elsewhere. But in my case, upon seeing that unprecedented emanation, I began to doubt the substance, and therefore the authenticity of human life, judged by the metric of spiritual history output. If a person's history was a total chronology of their being, then the inhuman emanation was a chronicle of several systems worth of histories. Not just an entire civilized species, but a vast, cosmos-spanning network of histories, 
all contained within this single emanation. It was in an immeasurable, unfathomable abundance of life that not only dwarfed but existentially overshadowed the collective histories of humanity. These descriptions, of course, are very vague, abstract, and speculative, and I doubt, even with all this exposition, that I have accurately conveyed how I felt in that moment, but they'll have to do. Just as quickly as the inhuman spiritual history had flared up, it had dissipated or was dismissed, and the middle person's spiritual history was again drawn over the other. Neither person's carrying regular histories noticed this incident, because like everyone else, they were oblivious to the very idea of spiritual histories. The third person, the imposter, turned and faced the direction they were going, while I stood dumbstruck, horrified, and suddenly sunk into depths of being deeper and darker than I had ever been in before. I want to say that I went on to see more of these entities, that after this initial meeting, this new exponentially more spiritual species revealed itself to me in different places, and different forms, knowing that there was nothing I could do to stop it, a cosmically clandestine invasion and usurpation of the human race. But that, that wasn't the case. In the two years that had passed, I haven't seen a single entity like it, nor have I seen it, or the person it is masquerading as anywhere else. It was just a horrific chance meeting with a cosmic interloper. How it came to Earth or why, I doubt I'll ever know. But what I've discovered about it and myself from that brief meeting has stayed with me has haunted me pretty much every moment of my life since then. I have one final thing to share, an incident which will hopefully help you understand that even seeing a regular person's spiritual history can have nightmarish effects. This happened yesterday and is the reason I've decided to finally talk about my unique condition. One benefit, the softest possible use of the word, of being able to see people's spiritual histories is having a glance in their immediate fates. Man knowing whether or not I would have any uncomfortable or even disastrous encounters with them. I've never had to avoid any sort of final destination moment before, but I have managed to sidestep potentially life-changing incidents and conversations that would have forced me to restructure the entire day to accommodate them. Like yesterday, I avoided being robbed. It wasn't some moment of heroism, I hadn't exactly intentionally saved myself. I was walking home from a pizza shop, there are still some things I can enjoy in life. Late at night when a man in his early 30s and extremely haggard stopped me as I rounded a corner, knife poised in my belly. He stood inches away and I saw the billowing emanation of his history up close. His eyes were narrowed dark, his mouth set into a thin, seemingly immovable line. The visage of someone who was familiar with hardship and struggle and had no qualms with introducing such things into the lives of others. He spoke a single word, wallet, and pressed the tip of the knife against awfully thin fabric of my shirt. As I mentioned, my life hasn't been great, hasn't been normal but in that moment, I still naturally valued the idea of it. I didn't want to die so I did as he requested, and removed my wallet from my pocket. Luckily, I had had about $25 in cash. I don't normally carry cash, but I decided to get cash back at the store so I could put a few bucks in the tip jar at the pizza place. But as I reached between the leathery folds to withdraw the bills, I happened to glance up at the man and found myself gazing deeply into his spiritual history. I don't usually peer into people's history. I respect it as an aspect of their personal privacy, but within such close proximity, it was virtually unavoidable. And I saw something almost as horrifying as the sight of that alien interloper two years ago. In this man's history, in his future, I watched him perform another transaction. But this time, his would-be victim was not an innocent pedestrian as I was. Instead of submitting and offering up his wallet, the person grappled with the mugger, eventually overpowering him. He then withdrew a phone from his pocket, made a call that lasted only a few seconds, and then with one hand around the mugger's neck, dragged him into the impenetrable darkness of a nearby alleyway. A few minutes later, a car pulled up, and the man forced the mugger inside. 
After that, they drove for a little less than an hour, and upon arriving at a very remote site far outside of town, proceeded to do absolutely appalling things to the unsuspecting criminal. His history, his future, ended there, brutally, terribly, mercilessly. I watched all this in a few moments, and my face clearly expressed my repulsion and fright at the loathsome images. I must have looked insane, reacting so viscerally to nothing, a reaction the mugger must have found odd, nonsensical for what to him would have been a common everyday occurrence. His confusion quickly gave way to unease and he lowered the knife, muttering something that I didn't hear. And keeping his eyes on me, he backed away into the darkness ahead, and was left shaking, my heart pounding uncontrollably. I had felt no specific sympathy for this man, but was still nonetheless horrified by what he had soon experienced. Even as my mind recoiled from the images, I had already come to the conclusion that there was nothing I could say to deter him from future prospects. That in the end, my reaction and escape would not be taken as a fateful sign of unpredictability and dangerousness of his poorly chosen profession. So, I went home, a belly full of pizza, a wallet full of cash, but with a heart already hardened and black, darkened further by the grim and dreadful future I had seen. These things, these incidents of terrifying clarity, of morbid prescience, are what I must live with. If I could, I would have a normal life, under virtually any definition of that word.